Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, where we talk with martial arts practitioners about their histories and the influence that their practice of martial arts has on their lives. You are listening to the free version of this podcast, which is abbreviated. Help support this program by considering to subscribe to us on Patreon, where you will get four full-length podcasts each month, one week before the YouTube release date. The cost is that of about one coffee shop coffee per month. Go to www.patreon.com slash malmag to subscribe. That is www.patreon.com slash M-A-L-M-A-G. If you would like to purchase single full-length episodes of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, visit our Gumroad page at malmag.gumroad.com. And that is M-A-L-M-A-G dot G-U-M-R-O-A-D dot com. This week I sit down in Marina Del Rey with Christopher Harley. He's one of my oldest friends, so this is going to be a wild ride, folks. Sit back and enjoy. Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, and today, whew, well, what can I say? Uh, finally got someone that I've been wanting to talk to. Well, I talk to him all the time, so let's put it this way. I finally got someone here that I want to record talking to. Um, person who's in contest for, I think, the most shout-outs on the podcast so far. And uh, I don't even know where to begin other than his name. Uh, welcome, Christopher Har- Harley, to the podcast. Uh, one of my best friends in the world, I have to say, and certainly uh, one of the person people who has uh, got a very good constitution in that he's put up with me for a long time on a personal level and training level, and I think that should get anyone an award. <laughs> it's, it's never been putting up with. So. I mean, okay, there might have been a few times like, seriously, dude, <laughs> you were supposed to be here 20 minutes ago. Yeah. But it's okay, because we're going to train for three hours, so it doesn't really matter. Right. <laughs> right. That's about the extent of it. Well, thanks for having me on. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad that I can finally put to rest some of the the mythos of who's this Chris Harley guy <laughs> that keeps getting mentioned. Uh, for anyone listening, if I've gotten a lot of mentions, it's just because I get around a lot, so I know a lot of people, and I'm fortunate enough to know a lot of really, really good people, and... Uh, consider them friends and, and so it's it's my quantity not not the audience's quality yeah <laughs> well and it, you know we run in a lot of the same circles so and you know yeah. that's the pool i've been grabbing from for the most part as well for the show so far so it's certainly worked out that way um, which is you know combination of all those things and so therefore people mention chris harley a bit <laughs> It happens. It happens. Well, shoot, I don't even know where to begin with you. Um, you know, you and I met in the early 2000s at the Inosanto Academy. Uh, it was certainly when they, I think, first came to the location that they're at now. Because um, I know they've, they've been there since 2004, and I want to say that that's about around when I came there. And... I think we both sort of had the same sort of happy accidents of being in the, the same classes with the same people and kind of picking up on the same things and became a familiar face to one another like, hey, you got a partner? No. You got a partner? No. Hey, you want to do something after class? Hey, grab a coffee? Yeah. And then you want to train some more and it kind of worked out and then here we are about 20 years later. Yeah, I mean, the, the main <laughs> thing was that we just, we had the same schedule basically. We both, you know, I was doing body work. Um, most of my clients were night times and weekends. You were doing your editing stuff and you were working nights. So there weren't a lot of people that consistently had their days free. And so it was sort of happy accent that we got along. Happy, really nice that attributes wise, completely different. <laughs> so no, you know, there wasn't going to be the competition there. There wasn't going to, it was just going to be like, okay, here's what, if you're going to make that work with me, you're going to have to do this. If you're going to make that work with me, you're going to have to do this. Oh, okay, you know. So it was very complimentary all the way across the board, I thought. Yeah, and I, I think that's something, certainly, I, I hope we dig into in our conversation is the idea of complimentary, tra- complimentary training, between training partners and, and um, the value of a good training partner and so on and so forth. But I have to warn you folks that Chris and I, when we get going, 
it goes where it goes uh, as far as conversation. So we can promise something now, but I can't. <laughs> It'll often circle back around, but it's it's, true. it takes about three hours. That's true. So uh, that this may be a little longer podcast. Well, there you go. Um, but let's, let's kind of start uh, with maybe how you got involved in martial art, because that's usually where I start with everyone in that, you know, give us a little of your history in that way. Um, my introduction to this family of martial art, well, my, my very first introduction to martial art was at summer camp where I learned probably to this day the most important um, move, technique, ever. And I was taking a judo class, I was like eight, maybe ten years old, and the first thing that the teacher did on the first day was line us up across from each other and say, okay, so I'm going to show you, hands down, of anything I show you, this is the most important. So we're all really paying attention. It's like, okay, on this side, put your hand out. Okay, other side, put your hand out. Okay, now put your hands together. Now shake your hands and say your name. Look the, look the other person in the eye, shake hands and say your name. I, you know, And it didn't hit super hard at the time, <laughs> um, but it did sort of have a feeling to it. And definitely to this day, that is, you know, if you're going to, if you want to think about different ways to apply what we learn in martial art, that is a practical application oh that is God. that is martial art for the street in a very basic way geez what do we all have in there i mean there's a lot to unpack in that simple thing there there is communication just in general right there is um, a respect or uh, courtesy uh, for acknowledgement of another human being there is hopefully if you're talking about a handshake and look in someone in the eye there's a level of confidence that if there is an issue maybe there isn't now because you're you're not a victim in your posture. In that, um, I don't know what else. <laughs> I mean, in that specific context, there's the added layer of acknowledging that we are about to do a thing together. Yeah. That this is a we project. Mm-hmm. Um, other things that that have come up over the years that have really come through are things like um, it takes a certain self confidence to share yourself like that. Right. right. That there's a lot of communication happening, like you already said, but but that can hold people back and to, to be given an instruction and permission that like, hey, you you deserve to be seen as well. Right. And having that be mutual. Um, there's there's the silliness of it. Right. Right? That <laughs> that actually kind of breaks down and breaks through a lot of the, the mystique and, and seriousness of martial art. Right. Um, and and that we're all kind of, you know, doing our best as we go through life and, and no one's really better than anybody. And, and uh, yeah, there's there's a ton. I mean, it, there's always lessons with that one, so. Yeah. Uh, so jump ahead, I had some other experiences, but to the family of martial arts that we're in, uh, I was introduced to that at a place called Tom Brown Jr.'s Tracking Wilderness and uh, Tracking Awareness and Wilderness Survival School. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of classes you can take at that school. And once you've gotten enough of them under your belt of, of certain kinds, uh, you, you can take the scout class. So Tom Brown's Tom Brown Jr.'s teacher was an Apache scout, um, and that's really the big package that everything's in. It gets mm-hmm. kind of put into smaller packages around. So that's, for a lot of people, that's like, when I first read his first book, right, and then I found out that there was a school, I was like, I want to do this, God, man, that's so cool. I was 15. Nice. <laughs> 14 when I read it, 15 when I first uh, started learning from him. Um, I think that's right. Or it's 15, 16, something like that. Um, so anyway, finally made it to the scout class. It took a really long time. I had all kinds of weird delays. Uh, and when I got there, uh, there were four people, five people, teaching the martial art component that was done in the morning. Really, I mean, partly to give some combative background so that people had that. I mean, scouts were capable of taking care of themselves and others pretty legendarily, mm-hmm. um, but in a very no-nonsense way. Um, so you don't want to go that far with it in that kind of class, right? But uh, you definitely need to. You're not getting any sleep. You know, it's all you're you're going out on raids and you're, you know, basically playing fancy nighttime tag. It's awesome. It's tons of fun <laughs> while while being hunted and, and people trying to tag you. <clears throat> um, 
um, et cetera. And by tag, it's, you know, a red magic marker across the throat that you didn't know was coming and then you're, hey. that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, the four, the, the four from this family were uh, Paul Bonner, who's from Canada, and then three folks from MKG, George Larson, Vanessa Herbst, and Atticus Todd. And then there was also Joe Lau, who is uh, from, uh, he's got a Bujinkan lin- lineage through Jack Hoban. Mm. Um, so they taught the, the martial art components. And then George, Vanessa, and Paul did a week-long immersion into an expansion of the martial art that we learned in the scout class. So took the scout, was immediately completely hooked. I was like, oh, this is the martial art. This is what I've always wanted, you know, and never really found when I've looked at other times for martial art stuff. Um, I believe the big eye-opener was at the very, very end, George showed, like, so here's all these answers. We talked about that, but, you know, someone's punching at you, and he just, he just puts his hand on the top of his head with his elbow out in front, and boom, punch right into the elbow. And oh, I was like, Seco destruction. Yeah, man. I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, why are we messing? Okay, I'm, I was already in, but now I'm really in. There's a funny thing about that with me, too, when I started to learn those kinds of destructions, because I don't know how much experience we would get into that. You've not had with, like, karate or any other martial art, right? And you get in and you spar, and you accidentally kick someone in the elbow. And then they go, oh, sorry, and you stumble around for that. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. You never put it together like, that's a good technique. <laughs> but I'll often say to people, especially if they're, like, students who are relatively... Students who are relatively, you know, recent, either to, maybe they've been training other stuff, but to, like, what we've been doing. Um, it'll be easy for them to get down on themselves. They're like, ah, and I was like, look, a huge part of what we're doing here is learning how to do on purpose right. what we keep doing on accident. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and not do it on accident to people we care about. Right, exactly. Um, which, there's a whole bunch of lessons there. Um, anyway, so I started doing those week-long intensives. Um, for a number of years, I went to... Uh, now, question, where, where were you living at at the time? You're, you're from Oakland. I'm from Oakland, California, so, so born and raised. you were living raised. in Oakland, and, and the camps were at East Coast? The camps were in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Okay. Um, and then the people we're talking about, Atticus, Vanessa, George, are based out of Minneapolis. Right. So we're talking about very spread out geographical areas. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So Back to what you're as, as, was, as was hinted at, I, I went to summer camp pretty young. Um, I just happened to have a camp that I could go to that, that you could be relatively, I think six, six was the youngest. And that's not super common for other camps. Um, and I was, I would always be gone all summer. I would always be off doing stuff. So the idea of traveling around to go do what I was interested in was heavily supported and, and reinforced my whole life. Um, so I was, I had just finished college. I did scout class that summer. Then I did, uh, oh, graduated U of O. <coughs> just in case anyone cares and well <laughs> go, and, whatever and was are. really lucky to go there because <laughs> what I wanted to be since I was little also si- around six around the time that I could understand that I still had the magical thinking of TV's real so uh, the six million dollar man was yes yeah, so I wanted to be bionic oh yeah and then that same period I also learned no TV's not real and um, I learned that he had had that that Lee Majors had had a little bit of stunt background. Uh, you know, at the time I also thought that like Burt Reynolds was cool and he'd had some stunt background. Yeah, he was a football player. Yeah. yeah. So so it shifted from being bionic, the fantasy, to mm-hmm. oh well, stunt work is a thing you can do. So I had always been interested in that. I ended up going to a, a university where you could take trampoline and springboard diving for credit. Ooh. So at a certain point I did that, and then very soon after that I was doing acrobatics seven, eight hours a week, assistant teaching, um, and just doing all that, because that was the, gonna be the best prep for stunt work. Um, and then of course, I didn't end up being a stuntman, but also around the same time that I discovered tracker school, uh, I got a pacemaker. So I did end up bionic, 
Right. <laughs> yes. So the yes. dream I gave up on. So, so the secret, everybody, is give up on your dreams. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll come back around. To and you. and pursue another way. one, and you'll find other cool stuff. That's right. Um, but you know, I, it was interesting because that was something I never knew about your background. I mean, I knew before you told me here, obviously, because you are the one who actually taught me how to roll properly. I mean, I've I've had a few lessons in it, but. You're, you're the one that really took the time and worked with me with it. And that, in and of itself, has probably saved me major bodily damage twice that I can remember of. <laughs> I mean, if there's... It, again, I'm talking about the practical aspect of martial art. Being comfortable on the ground, being comfortable with going down to the ground and getting back up, that's literally life-saving into your 90s. Right. Yeah. You know, that is the stuff that's really going to matter. Um, and yet it gets so heavily overlooked. Right. And then also for bigger guys like yourself, going down is a little different than right. it is for smaller people. Right. You know, it's just, that's a lot more force. Uh-huh. And if you don't know how <laughs> to works. absorb it or, or even diffuse it, um, it it's going to be a lot less fun. So, which, uh, anyway, I eventually do... After doing a bunch of tracker stuff, I just that's when I decided, oh, I'm not going to move to L.A. and be a stuntman. Um, I'm going to live in Tahoe and track all the time. Just, I've done it a little bit here and there. We'll wait for this to... Yeah. Or maybe it won't matter. I'll just keep talking. Um, anyway, I, I had sort of an epiphany, a shift in perspective where I realized as much as I would love to do stunt work... It doesn't help anybody. I mean, it's entertaining, right? You know, and you're probably helping each other with, you know, and everything. But it's not. It doesn't need to be a grand purpose kind of thing. But I realized I was going to be much happier if I was doing stuff that really did actually help people. Um, and so, at the time, I was thinking, well, there's there's a definite disconnection between people and that people generate. It's not a real disconnection that people generate between themselves and the rest of the world that everyone calls nature. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry, folks. I'm laughing because we, Chris and I have had this conversation about nature and natural, I don't know how many times. And so sorry, you're going to hear me break into laughter about things that we've, we've kind of already gone over in humorous ways. Um, so... Well, anyway. I mean, so sum up, like, my, what's my stance on that? Right. Uh, everything's natural. Right. Everything is natural. <laughs> and I'll let him go into it a little more for you. It's, it's there's, there's no such thing as not nature. <laughs> exactly. If it exists, I don't care what solar system it's in. Right. I don't care what city it's in. Like, it, everything's natural. I eat naturally. Some things are... Yeah, yes, you do. Yeah, we, some things are artificial. Do. Right. Right? Because that because humans make tools, and that's what we do. We have artificial thought processes. We have artificial... Uh, tools we have our you know mm -hmm. artifice is a thing and wild is a thing mm -hmm. but also lots of wild things have artifice too you know right. bees termites they transform other things into other useful things right like and everyone you can you can nitpick about scale I don't care you're it, I, I'm right <laughs> there yes. isn't, this isn't an arguable thing. No, it's really um, not. And any resistance to it is really useful because it helps you see that there's separations that you're creating in your own life that aren't serving you. Um, and it doesn't really take a lot to shift and, and uh, can get a lot of benefit from it. You know, I'm right. not saying it's better, it's, but it is more accurate than Spirit Valley. So, anywho, I thought if I spent a lot more time in wild spaces and particularly really developing my tracking skills um, and, and some of my scout skills and, and some other stuff um, and my survival skills uh, I'd be getting I'd be in the, the wild school learning from a thing that can't lie right? things are how they are Right. there's no deception in that and people are like oh well, what about camouflage it's, there's a way camouflage works mm -hmm. and you once you understand it it, it's very honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not actually a lie. Right. Um, it's not the same as, as the artifice of a lie. Correct. A lie is artificial. Right. Anyway, uh, I'm sure a bunch of people have buttons being pushed right now, but good. Um, anyway, I decide that's what I'm going to do. I end up uh, also trying to work my awareness skills and some of my 
what I'm learning in martial art. Uh, hey guys, hey. how are you? Good. Good. All right. Well, uh, we're recording a podcast. Let's introduce oh. you. No, no, come on. Sorry, it's not live. No, no, come here. So, so uh, guys, we just had a sea lot camp, and um, there's a couple people here that I actually want to get on the show at some point. This is Jakob and Astrid. They're from Austria. And hi. just say hi. Because <laughs> we're sitting outside at the coffee bean, and they came walking by. They're, are you guys getting ready to head out? Yeah. We're just killing a little bit of time before we go. All right. So they're getting ready to head back to the airport and, and leave us to go back to Austria. It's always awesome to see them. It's always awesome to see you guys. Yeah. When you guys are around for a camp, the vibe is different. Yeah. I enjoy oh, yeah. it more. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah there's too. something you bring to it that's the. Uh, maybe it's because you guys are helping with the sales and stuff, yeah. and so more people have interaction with you, and they just kind of people just chill a little and enjoy themselves. So. Yeah, I've been doing so much, but if it helps a little bit, that's that's fine. Hey, okay. anything Little's is more than nothing. Absolutely. Yeah, and it helps Guru also, so because the cab is running more smoothly, and Guru can just teach and no incidents, nothing. So absolutely, that's good. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Thank you. So Thank you guys, you. well, here, I'll take a hug before you go. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. And think about this. I want to put you on here if you're, if you're comfortable. Good luck with your podcast. Well, thank you. Have a nice. All right. Bye. We'll talk to you guys soon. Safe travels. Bye-bye. Uh, I was working the door at a uh, the busiest place in Tahoe City. So not like nothing rough and tumble or anything, but... Good place to dabbled in a little security. Yeah, good okay. place to keep my awareness up and learn, and you know read people and the, and a big part of my value with that uh, was having a spotting stuff before it happens, being very proactive and and all that. So uh, a lot of lessons there and good experiences. Um, yeah. So uh, eventually I moved to Los Angeles and <clears throat> was going to do body work, but and I was moving because someone else wanted to move, so I went okay sure um even though i had a good deal going in town and then uh and then somebody else wasn't really part of the equation anymore and i was like well i'm here and at least i get to train at the academy and so i was doing body work and basically training like with you right 20 plus hours a week i had a part-time job of training right um which was awesome and tons of fun and uh and i continued to do during all that time i continued to do seminars and, and take seminars not teach Right, um, and got my the first promotion I ever got in any art was from George and Ness. They gave me my Phase One and MKG uh, method certificate. Um, I think it was actually the year. It might have been the year Kurt took his first one. Oh wow! Took one one. Um, uh oh, Kurt's on the show now. And this concludes the abbreviated version of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast. Please click the like and subscribe buttons as well as the notification bell. Also consider subscribing to the full-length podcast at www.patreon.com slash malmag or purchasing individual full-length episodes at malmag.gumroad.com. Thank you for listening to this episode with Christopher Harley. Coming up next week, a gentle giant, someone that makes me even look short, Nick Hahn. Check out the Melmag store at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and click on the store tab. There, you will find a full selection of Timmy B's brand sticks for FMA and Kirby Kerbong, as well as Timmy B's and Dos Manos t-shirts. Many more products coming soon. Also click on our courses tab to purchase online courses, right now featuring the course in the Dos Manos stick of FMA. More courses to come. This show is produced by Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine. Visit us at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and enjoy the free version of our online magazine with articles, a recommended schools page, and a worldwide events calendar. Music by Jack Al Relic. Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine and the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast are trademarked and copyrighted by TNT LLC. Music.